Good to be back in Chicago. Um, if you hear any A's or abouts or anything, I'm Canadian, so I uh, apologize in advance. Um, but um, yeah, this is uh, my second time uh, at this conference, so I'm excited to kind of get connected with some of you. For those of you who are not familiar with me or, or the organization that I run, um, it's called the Location-Based Marketing Association. We're a nonprofit trade association. We represent about 1,400 member companies globally, and uh, we have offices in all the cities you see there. Um, and we define location-based marketing as the intersection of people, places, and media. And we're really focused on that last part. When we say media, we mean all media, not just mobile, but radio, television, out of home. And look at how location as a data set kind of ties all that and unites that all together. And we have a very diverse member base that include some of the brands that you see there just as a kind of representative. Um, we also do a fair bit of research, obviously, as a trade association. So back at uh, South by Southwest earlier this year, we released these, uh, these numbers, and I thought I'd pull some of it out for you. Um, so we surveyed 50 of the uh, CMOs, heads of digital marketing, for uh, major brands in, in five different markets, so in total about 250 CMOs. And we asked them a bunch of questions around, what are they planning to invest in as far as location, proximity, technology uh, this year? And interestingly enough, at the top of that list in the US, 63% uh, of folks were looking at social location. And the reason I, I highlight that today is because in talking to the industry and in talking to uh, folks around the world, what we see is this, this movement by some of the social platforms that we're all familiar with, whether that's Snapchat or Instagram or Alipay or WeChat or what have you. I was, I was in Thailand last week talking to the folks at Line, and they're all moving to build payments into these social platforms. Um, and you can see the current deployment of this technology here in the US, 22% of retailers in particular um, have beacons already in their stores. Um, uh, a lot of people have Wi-Fi, more than half, and you see where the NFC penetration is at the moment. Um, and if they didn't have it, we asked them, are they planning to add it between when we did this survey back in January of this year and the end of this year, and 16% of the folks who didn't have it were planning on adding beacons this year. Uh, and you see the, the uh, follow-on numbers there in the, the other categories. So there's a lot of money coming into this space. When we look at the location services technology industry, we're looking at about a $3 billion uh, industry at the moment, okay, in terms of the technology infrastructure spend. Now, one of the concepts that we uh, like to talk about at the LBMA is something that we call the three-layer location cake. And the reason uh, that we started to put this concept in the marketplace is in particular when we look at the retail sector, we see a lot of retailers over-investing or over-focusing on things like Beacon technology. And if you're all familiar with Beacons and, and all that kind of stuff. And the problem is, is that if that's all we do is, as far as our location strategy is concerned, we're kind of selling ourselves short because Beacons by definition are useless if you have nobody in your stores, right? You got to get them there. And so there's a set of location technologies at the bottom of the cake that are focused on driving traffic, right, and getting people there in the first place. Those social location platforms I talked about, Snapchat, Instagram, you know, all these guys are opening up location, Twitter, to understand where is somebody snapping, where is somebody posting, and when they're posting about your brand, how close are they to a store? How, we, how do we move them from point A to point B? We need to do that. That's where geofencing, that's where urban airship and all that push messaging technology becomes really interesting. Once we have them there, we can turn to that second layer of the cake, which is increased basket size, increased dwell time, increased engagement. That's where beacons and Wi-Fi and magnetics and all the other proximity, you know, um, sort of micro-location technologies take over, right? But we have to have them there to be, you know, in the first place. And we can't stop there. We need to go to where you guys are. We need to take these beacon technologies and these Wi-Fi and these other platforms. We need to integrate them up the stack with the payments platforms, with the point of sale systems, with the loyalty platforms, with the CRM systems. And it becomes a cycle because if we don't have the data to inform what messaging we're pushing on the marketing side, then we're not really engaging the customer in that true one-to-one -one relationship that we all want. So if we look at these three layers very quickly in, in some of the examples, so one of the things that we get to do that is really fun in my job is besides doing research and running conferences and being a nonprofit and being a, a pain in the ass to the government and lobbying and so, and so on, we get to work with these 1,400 member companies, more than half of which are brands, and we get to put together pilots and test concepts and push location into the industry and drive it forward. So when Pokemon came out, uh, we worked with Niantic, who's the guys behind uh, uh, Pokemon, 
uh, you know, we were right there with, you know, Sephora and Forever 21 and helping to drive these tests into the industry to see if we can kind of jump on this phenomenon and then actually turn it into something that resulted in, in, in revenue uh, or engagement. And so there's opportunities to use this, again, to drive traffic to the store. You have to start at the bottom of the cake. Another way to think about it is this example. So another one of our members is Mondelez uh, Craft Foods. And they have a division called Oscar Meyer that you might have heard of. Uh, and I'm Canadian, and we like bacon. And so we went to them, and we said, well, another one of our members who uses location is Tinder. Do we have any Tinder users here? Okay, everybody knows what it is though, right? <laughs> okay, um, so we took the concept of Tinder and played that into the food industry by taking what people like to eat, personal preferences and so on, and layer that on top of, in this case, Oscar Mayer. Whoops, let me see if I can get that to play. Hold on, let me just go back. Woo. There we go, okay. Hi, I'm Logan. I'm not in this for a one night stand. I'm in it for the long haul. I think my mom is really gonna like you. Do you like the smell of chest hair? When my friends talk about me, they say things like, Kyle's awesome. I wanna be like Kyle. What do your friends say about you? I wanna take out my contacts and put them in your eyes. <laughs> he likes to wash. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> What's the bacon? I love bacon. The naturally smoked kind? Yeah, that's been cured for a really, really long time. Oh, exactly. <laughs> Sounds like you know what you like. I like bacon. Do you want these? I do want bacon lovers. I'm going to out for bacon lovers. It's passionately cured for 12 hours and lovingly smoked out for the lovingly. Oscar Meyer, the bacon for bacon lovers. Now, and all kidding aside, if you are single and you do like bacon, this is a real app, and you can download it, okay? Um, it is available in the app store, so there you go. All right. So, so we got them in the store now, right? We, we've kind of played with that bottom layer of the cake. We drove the traffic there. Now it's about increasing basket dwell time and engagement. So here's an example of a project that we did with IKEA up in Toronto, where I am. Um, and so we created this kind of pop-up IKEA store with limited products. There was uh, about 100 products uh, available, but instead of you having to push that cart around IKEA and lug that stuff around and carry that bag and all that kind of stuff, instead, when you walked in, there was this wall of wooden spoons sitting there, and you grab a spoon, and the spoon's in, uh, got an RFID chip embedded in it, and then you walk around the store, and all of the products have these little uh, uh, place cards with the product information, price, and you simply take your spoon and tap the cart. And that's how you add it to your basket. Okay, and then when you get to checkout, you basically your, your, your basket's already been put together for you, product's already been sourced, and uh, it's, it's just brought right to you at checkout, and you simply you know, pay from that perspective. Right? It's about convenience, it's about increasing engagement, but it's about taking technology and making it simple. When we think about increasing engagement, you know, if I turn to the retail banking sector now for a, for a second, you know, we work with Barclays, we work with City, we work with a lot of banks. Um, and here we're seeing beacons come in in a whole different way. Beacons, for the most part, when you think about retail, have been looked at as a thing as, you know, let's push a coupon or an offer or a deal or a discount. But it's, that, that's, that's going away very, very quickly. And we have a lot of research to back that up. Instead, what we're seeing is, is a, uh, a different thought process that refocuses it on customer service. So on the left, uh, last year we did a project in the UK with Barclays around International Day with People with Disabilities. If you had the Barclays app and you're a disabled person, you download, you register uh, you know, the app with them. And then when you walk into the branch, basically uh, you break the geofence uh, and the beacons detect that you're there. Instead of the beacon sending you some offer or some message, it sends a message to the staff at that branch, letting them know that a disabled person has entered the branch and might need additional assistance. So we're using the beacons in a whole different context. Similarly over here, Citibank has now got beacons here in the US in the branch uh, ATMs, you know, those glass closed, uh, you know, corridor type things. So you're out partying all night, you're drinking, you need to get some more cash to keep the, keep the fun going. Um, and you, you, you come up to that thing and then you got to fumble with your, your wallet, find your card to swipe it in the door to open the door and, and get into the ATM, right? No more. Now they've got beacons in there. You've got, you know, the Citibank app. Uh, it can create a handshake with the beacon. You basically hold your phone up to the door and it opens the door for you. 
Okay, so we have this kind of convenience that's coming now as a way to increase engagement, dwell time, and stickiness, if you will. And as we turn to that last layer of the cake, it is about transactions and data integration, as I said. You've got partnerships emerging between companies like Revel and PayPal. You have DigiCash, which is a beacon-based payment platform. And you have others like that, iZettle, um, Seamless, and so on, that we work with in Europe. You have Dwayne Reed taking their entire loyalty data platform um, and integrating it directly with what's going on in the store, whether that's through the beacons or through Wi-Fi or through other transactional platforms. It's all about personalizing the offer and the message, not just any message and the same message to everybody. It's coming right off your own loyalty points. You know, hey, you have 30 points right now. Why don't you redeem those? Here's what you can get for that, right? As we detect you uh, in your presence in the store. And we, as we think about these integrated data experiences, here's another example of something that we did with a, a grocery retailer in Brazil a little while ago that looks at uh, direct tie-ins to the point of sale system. Most people still think mayonnaise is only good for sandwiches. And even though Helmut has been successfully teaching new users to consumers, one challenge still remained, the point of sale. We needed to take advantage of the moment when customers have all the right ingredients at hand. Helmut's recipe receipt. If there's Helmut's in your shopping cart, there's a recipe on your receipt. The software was installed in around 100 cash registers at a major supermarket chain. The consumers do their groceries as usual. At the cash register, the software recognizes the Helmut's bag. That's not me. Quickly combines Helmut's with other purchased products and generates a custom recipe instantly printed on the receipt. Beef, onions, tomato, helmets, fill up with onion sauce, chicken, parsley, curry, helmets, chicken fingers with curry, manioc, sausage, egg, helmets, yucca balls, The software was installed in all cashiers for over three months. In the first month alone, the sales increased 44%, and thousands of recipes were printed, teaching people how to use helmets to prepare salads, meats, sauces, pastas, and even sandwiches. So we need to look at that data integration layer. We need to think about the technology that's readily available to us right now and see how we can tie that into what's already there. The last example I want to share with you is this. And this, this is something places uh, one of our members out of Seattle. And um, they're kind of trying to become the Nielsen of location data, if you will. So they've got a panel of consumers going around that have agreed to share you know, everywhere that they go basically with these guys and then tell them what they're doing in these places and what they're buying, what they're spending, and so on. And so just last week, they announced a new app where to, to get more people on board, now you can go and share your location exchange in exchange for actual airline frequent flyer points. Um, so again, it's about tying that data together. It's about taking something that people want and finding ways to monetize it um, and doing that sort of value exchange, if you will. And I'm going to beg two more minutes. I know I'm, I'm over. I'm going to show you one last example um, of a project that we did in the UK last year. And because we're a nonprofit, we also like to support other uh, you know, nonprofits. And so a lot of the pilots and a lot of test work that we do is, is in that vein. And so we worked with, in the UK with um, a company here to, to create um, a campaign for, uh, to try and bring attention to the issue of uh, domestic violence against women. But what you're going to see here is, is a lot of technology, facial recognition, proximity-based payments. Um, you're going to see digital signage. You're going to see location. You're going to see all this kind of stuff come together. But at the end of the day, the technology kind of fades to the background, and it's really about the engagement of the consumer. Whoops. Hold on. Let's see.
It's just a regular digital out of home display from a company called Ocean Outdoor that we work with in the UK. So that's all my time allows today, but the, the last thing I, the thought I want to leave you with is that it's not about transactions, right? We can focus too much on that, I think, sometimes in, in the space that we're, we're in, whether it's location or payments or, or mobile uh, or all of it. Uh, it is, however, about creating human, emotional, connected experiences. And I think if you see one theme through all of what I've showed you in the examples very quickly here is that the technology kind of disappears into the background, right? And the consumer doesn't care about it. And they don't care about your mobile wallet or anything either. What they care about is convenience. They care about connectedness. They care about you recognizing that they're people and humans first and that you're appealing to that uh, and not just trying to facilitate a transaction. Thanks for your time. <laughs>